Good morning. My name is Mikko. Now, have you recently been to a factory? Have you visited any construction site or manufacturing plant or chemical plant or food processing plant? Because if you have, you would have noticed that um, it all nowadays looks very technical. It's all about automation. It's all about electronics. It's all about computers. It's all about the kind of gear you would more likely see in a uh, in an IT room than in a factory floor. And of course, this change has been going on for quite a while. This change has been going on because everything is becoming a computer. Our factories have already become computers. And yes, they are online. They are all interconnected. And yes, there are links from most factories to public networks, including the internet. And the best lesson on risks of industrial control systems and factory automation we learned in 2010. Because in 2010, we found Stuxnet. In our business, we speak about time before Stuxnet and time after Stuxnet. That's how big a deal it was. Because Stuxnet was unique. I remember summer of 2010 very well. We spent the whole summer in our lab trying to figure out what the hell is this? What is this unique, massively large, massively complex piece of malware which contained not one, not two, but three zero-day vulnerabilities which it used to infect Windows systems around the world, spreading on USB thumb drives, and then once it had infected those Windows computers, it used them as a vector to gain access to the factory floor. And one of the biggest mysteries we had in, in Stuxnet was that Stuxnet wasn't just going to start modifying the operation of, of any factory or any plant. It had a fingerprint. It was searching for a very specific factory. It had a fingerprint it was searching for. And the fingerprint looked like this. It was searching for specific high-frequency power converters which had been configured in this exact configuration. A configuration where you have four high-frequency power converters by side, and then those are configured in groups of one, 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 two, two, three, three, four, and so on. So, I spoke with plant engineers and industrial control system experts about this. And they all told me that this is, this is highly unique. This is not any common way of configuring high-frequency power converters, no matter what you use the converters for, and they all told me that it's highly likely there's only one place on the planet which would have this configuration. So this would be the fingerprint. This would tell us what Stuxnet is searching for. This would tell us the target of Stuxnet. Now, we already had our suspicions. This is now summer of 2010. We're at the height of the tensions about Iranian nuclear program, and slowly but surely we started to realize that, holy hell, this malware we're looking at, this might actually just be targeting the Iranian nuclear enrichment system, which would make it a weapon. That we're looking at a weapon. This piece of malware is not malware, this is a weapon. So, we assumed that if this indeed is an attack from a government, this would be a governmental use of offensive cyber power. Governments, intelligence agencies, and militaries are interested in offensive use of cyber power for a very good reason. Cyber weapons work. 
cyber weapons are effective, affordable, and deniable. Effective, affordable, deniable. That's a pretty good combination of features in a weapon. It's an effective weapon, it gets the job done. It's an affordable weapon, it's cheaper than the alternatives. And you can deny it. You can deny it that it wasn't yours. There's no weapons which you can deny except cyber weapons. So if indeed this was an attack, the target would have to be a, a factory or a plant, a nuclear enrichment plant inside Iran. So it could be Bushrer, it could be Qom, it could be Natans. So the question became, does any of these nuclear enrichment plants inside Iran that we know of have a configuration which looks like this? And that's a very good question. Because how do you find out? It's not like we could just Google for what the configuration looks like inside nuclear enrichment plants inside Iran. Except we sort of could Google for it. Because a colleague of ours from Germany went looking for information. And he ended up on the website of the president of Iran at the time. President Ahmadini, ah, this guy. <laughs> so on the website of the president, you would find photographs of him visiting schools and universities and companies, and also pictures of him visiting nuclear enrichment plants. So this is a visit the president did in 2008, two years before Stuxnet. This is in Natanz. And you can see him walking by the infamous centrifuges. These are the centrifuges. And you can actually see that, yes, there are four centrifuges by the side of each other. Four, just like in the picture. What you don't see is the logical structure. You can't see that from a photo. However, in this set of photos, there's one picture in which the president is leaning over and looking at a computer screen. And then we can use Photoshop and enhance the picture and zoom in and look at the details and yes, the structure, the logical structure of the high frequency power conf configurators can, see, can be seen from the photo and it matches exactly the fingerprint in Stuxnet. This is how we knew. This is how we knew already in the summer of 2010 that Stuxnet was uh, uh, trying to control the centrifuges in Natanz. It was all based on a photo found from the website of the president. This, my friends, this is the power of open source intelligence. And this was the defining moment in how governments use offensive cyber power. So, was this cyber war? Was Stuxnet an attack in cyber war? No. No, it wasn't. Why? Because the attackers, United States and Israel, were not at war with the target, Iran. If they would have been at war and they would have done this attack, then this would have been cyber war. But since there was no war, how could there be cyber war? So Stuxnet was not cyber war. Stuxnet was cyber sabotage. And yes, words matter. We shouldn't be calling something a war if it isn't war. Most of the governmental attacks we see, most of the governmental attacks we analyze are not war, regardless of what's printed in the newspapers. Most of the governmental attacks are actually either sabotage or spying. The most typical use of offensive cyber power for governments is spying. They're mostly being used by intelligence agents and intelligence agencies. And spying isn't war. Spying is spying. And if spying isn't war, we shouldn't be calling it a war. 
Because we will need that word, the word cyber war, for real cyber war. All right. So what would real cyber war then look like? Real cyber war would look like this. Petya, or not Petya, from last summer, summer of 2017. The infamous attack targeting Windows computers, which were all running this piece of software, MEDOC, bookkeeping software, developed in Kyiv, in Ukraine, used by companies across Ukraine and only in Ukraine for doing bookkeeping and for filing their taxes with the Ukrainian government. Sometime in May, or maybe early June, in 2017, Russians, <coughs> unknown attackers, unknown attackers breached the security of the servers of the company that was making this bookkeeping software. This Ukrainian company making this bookkeeping software for Ukrainian companies. And on the 29th of June, the unknown attackers used the official update server of MEDOC to ship an update to every customer running this bookkeeping software. And that update was Petya. If you were running this software on the 29th of June, your company got infected by Petya. Petya, which started immediately spreading further in your network and started overriding the master boot records of your laptops, desktops, and your servers. And yes, by far the worst hurt company, the, sorry, the first uh, hurt country in the world was Ukraine. Because this was Ukrainian software, only used in Ukraine, only used by Ukrainian companies. And this was not the first time Russia was targeting Ukraine. And what makes this attack different from Stuxnet is that this is war. Russia and Ukraine are at war. Cyber war is a new domain. War happens in different domains. 500 years ago, when we were fighting wars, we were fighting our wars, wars with swir swords and uh, cross and bow, because we had no other technology. So we only had land war. Eventually, we had good enough technology to build warships. So war expanded from land war into sea war. Eventually, we got planes. So we got air war, but none of these new domains took away land war. We still fight war on lands and sea and air. Then we got satellites, space war, and now cyberspace war. But none of these new domains take away the existing domains. So it's just a new domain for war. It's a new domain for war. It's a new domain for conflict. And during this conflict, Russia and Ukraine, Petya was not the first attack. Already over two years ago, in December 2015, we saw the infamous attack against this company called Prikarpat. Prik this company. I actually know how to say it. It's Prikarpat to Oblenergo. So. Prikarpat to Oblenergo is the second largest electricity grid provider in Ukraine. They were the target of the infamous electricity grid attack on Christmas Eve's Eve 2015, an attack which got power from over 250,000 people. And it gets pretty cold in Ukraine in December. When you cut power from hundreds of thousands of civilians, that is a very serious attack. But if we think back, to Petya, and last summer, and, and the news around Petya. This was not the story we heard. When Petya started going around and started overriding boot sectors, shutting down companies, the story we read from the newspapers, the story we saw in television, was not about Ukraine. The story was about massively large Western companies getting hit by Petya. 
companies like these, brands like these, companies which have nothing to do with Ukraine. What, why would they get hit? The attack was supposed to be from Russia targeting Ukraine, being targeted by this financial software, which is only used in Ukraine. Well, while these companies are not Ukrainian companies, what they all are is that they are global companies, massively large companies operating all over the world, doing business in every country on the planet, or most of the countries on the planet. Companies like Maersk. Every fifth container being shipped on ships, cars and trains on the planet is being shipped by Maersk. Every fifth container on the planet is being shipped by this. So they ship them all over the world. They definitely ship them to Ukraine. Of course, because they ship them everywhere. Which means they do a lot of business in Ukraine. Which means they have to file taxes in Ukraine. And if your company has to file taxes in Ukraine, the way your company files taxes to the Ukrainian government is by running ME Doc. So all these companies had at least one workstation in their network running ME Doc. And if you had one workstation in your network running ME Doc, you got Petya on the 29th of June. And once you get Petya, In most networks, if they haven't been segmented correctly, or if the access to domain credentials haven't been secured perfectly, it will spread like wildfire. So for example, in the case of Marsk, many of their harbors were shut down. Like ships were coming in, and cars were coming in to pick up the containers, but the gates would not open the gates to harbor wouldn't open. Why? Because the gates were being controlled by computers. Because everything is becoming a computer. So when the confused truck drivers who couldn't get into the harbor tried calling the company, the calls wouldn't go through. Why? Because their voice over IP systems were down because they were being controlled by computers. In this particular case, it became so bad that they didn't only lose tens of thousands of laptops to Petya. They also lost thousands of servers, including their ADs, their authentication servers. This company had 151 ADs all over the world. AD servers containing all the information about their network, including all user credentials, usernames, passwords, access rights, network structure, 151 servers. What's even more interesting is that they didn't have a backup of these AD servers, because you don't need a backup of them. Why would you take a backup of them? You already have 151 backups. They're all being mirrored all over the world between the AD servers. And it's highly unlikely that you would lose all 151 AD servers at the same time. Except with Petya, that's exactly what happened. And when all of their ADs were overwritten, they had no backups. No way to recover, no way to rebuild the network. They actually got lucky. Because during the investigation, they found out that actually of the 151 ADs they had, only 150 were overwritten. And then there was one AD they couldn't find. And eventually they found it from Africa, from Ghana. Because there had been a power outage in Ghana during the Petty outbreak. So then they made a very careful phone call to Ghana that you have this AD server there, please do not plug it in. <laughs> and then they actually sent a guy over to pick it up. And that's how they started recovering. So what was the mistake these companies did? What's the mistake? Well, I don't know. 
These companies were global companies. They were doing business all over the world, doing business in Ukraine, which means they had to file taxes in Ukraine. You can't negotiate that. If you do business in the country, you have to file taxes there. And the way you file taxes is by running this software. And if these companies would have asked me before Petya that should we keep automatic updates enabled? The default setting is that it automatically updates itself is this a good idea? I would have told them, yes, that's a good idea. Keep the automatic updates enabled. Because that's what we have been telling companies for 10 years. Updates are a good idea. You get patches, you get better security, you get security fixes, update your systems, patch your systems. Here, it was the patches which burned them. So were these Western companies which got hurt by Petya, collateral damage. Maybe. Or maybe this was Russia trying to send a message to Western companies. Maybe this was Russia sending a message to Western companies that, you know what? You shouldn't be doing business in Ukraine. We don't like you doing business in Ukraine. If you do business in Ukraine, we will fuck you up. So that's what they did. We don't know whether this was an accident or whether this was a message. What we do know is that this was the single most expensive computer security incident in history. Single most expensive computer security incident in history. More expensive than any malware outbreak, more expensive than any hack, more expensive than any data leak ever. And this happened last year. This happened during our watch. So for years and years, what we've been telling companies is that you should be securing your network like it would be a safe. Just keep everybody out all the time. Keep all the attackers out from your network and you'll be fine. Build thick walls and th thick doors and good locks like you would be building a safe. In a network, this means, you know, big firewalls and intrusion prevention mechanisms and filters and proxies and antiviruses. And if you build a safe like this, if you build a safe with thick walls, thick doors and a good lock, then you will not need a motion detector inside the safe. Like, why would you put a motion detector inside the safe? Nobody's going to get in the safe. Nobody's going to get in because you have thick walls, thick doors and a good lock. Well, what if someone gets in in a way that you didn't think about? What if someone gets in in a surprising way? Like, I don't know, coming in through the ceiling or something like that. If that happens, then actually it would be nice, it would be really nice to have a motion detector inside your network, inside your safe. And this is the way we should be thinking about our networks today. Nobody wants to get breached. No company wants to get breached. It's never something we're looking for. But we should assume it's going to happen anyway. We should assume breach. We should assume that our safeguards will fail. We should assume that our firewalls and proxies and filters and antiviruses will fail. And then the question becomes how to detect that you have a breach and how to respond to your breach. Because for most companies, this takes an awfully long time. They don't detect it. We know this because we run incident response teams and we regularly get phone calls from companies, panic calls. Oh my God, we've just been hacked. Can you come right away? Can you come right now? We need help. So our guys come rushing over and start looking at the network 
only to realize that the company was hacked last year. And then they tell the client that, yeah, you were hacked last year. I mean, there was no rush. We could have come next week. Nothing would have been different next week. The average time for a company to detect that it's been breached is 200 days. So you have to be running the motion detectors inside your network if you want to be able to tell the difference between a clean network and an infected network. And these are the kinds of solutions that, for example, we are building with our rapid detection service, where we have sensors, motion detectors, inside a network, collecting information, building a baseline on what's normal. And when we know what's normal, then we can start looking for what's not normal. Then we use advanced techniques, like machine learning, to figure out what's important. And then we escalate the cases to real human analysts who will look at the data and figure out that, hey, this is important. We'll call you. So it doesn't take you 200 days to figure out if something is wrong or not. And what makes these challenges even harder for current networks is that it's no longer just the computers we have to defend. Everything is becoming a computer. All these connected devices, all these smart devices in our networks. And I should know, because I am the father of the Hyppönen law, which tells you that whenever something is described to you as smart, what you should be hearing is vulnerable. So, here's a smartphone. Vulnerable phone. Here's a smartwatch. Vulnerable watch. Smart car, smart city, smart grid. You get my point. And yes, it is a very pessimistic law, but it's also true. If you think about the traditional wristwatch that you have to wind, how do you hack that? Well, you don't. But then when you have a smartwatch, which is online on the internet, at least in theory, you can hack that. And everything is becoming a computer. Everything is going online. Everything is becoming smart, like smart trash cans. This is actually a, a pretty smart idea. The idea of putting sensors in trash cans. Because what these sensors do, and this is a real product, is that they will record the location of every trash can in the city. Then they will locate and, and measure how full the trash cans are. Which means now the city can optimize how the trash trucks drive through the city, emptying the trash cans, which saves power, saves energy, saves hours of work time. However, when the company which was designing and building these sensors, these yellow things that are put inside trash cans, started deploying them in real cities, they ran into a problem. Because these sensors started breaking. They started coming back, broken. And they were really surprised that they were breaking, because these are really hardened devices. They're supposed to be inside a trash can. They're not supposed to break easily. And when they came back, they were horribly broken. They were in pieces. They couldn't figure out why. They couldn't figure out why until they started looking at security camera footage, which showed them that they actually weren't getting broken by accident. They were actually being, being beaten into pieces by, by who? By the truck drivers. The truck drivers hated these things. They hated these new smart trash cans because before these sensors, they would go around the city and empty the trash once a week. After these sensors, they would go around the city and empty the trash once a month. These yellow sensors were taking money out of their pockets. They hated them. And this, my friends, this is what the human uprising against robots looks like. 
Human uprising against robots is not about Terminator 2. It's about trash truck drivers breaking IoT sensors. And when everything is becoming a computer, companies get hacked in surprising ways. Companies get hacked in ways that they don't expect. So, for example, one of the largest data breaches in history, largest credit card breaches in history, the Target case from four years ago, in which Target, the retail chain in the United States, lost millions of credit card numbers. In this case, the actual credit card numbers were lost as customers were paying at the cashier desks for their own purchases, putting their credit cards into official credit card terminals. The shop's own credit card terminals were stealing the credit card numbers. So how did the attackers get in? How did the attackers gain access to the credit card terminals? Well, it turns out that the attackers got in through the ventilation system. And no, I don't mean Bruce Willis or Tom Cruise crawling in through the ventilation system. I mean the computers controlling the ventilation systems. Because everything is becoming a computer. In this building, the ventilation systems are right now being controlled by something like this. ICS boxes made by Honeywell or Siemens or any of the manufacturers that build this kind of gear. In practice, these are all Linux boxes, Linux servers controlling actuators and switches which control the world around us. Which means they are computers, they can be hacked. In this case, this is how the attackers got into the network. Then they used lateral movement to move from the ventilation and refrigeration system to the backbone network of the company. From there, they gained access to the financial network of the company. From there, they gained access to the credit card terminals and stole millions of credit card numbers. I've started doing something whenever I visit our customer company. Whenever I'm at a customer, at some stage I ask if somebody would take me around, show me around their facilities. I'd like to see what they do. And all companies are always very, very happy to take me around and show, you know, here's our manufacturing facilities, and here's our design department, here's our marketing, here's our sales, here's our top management, this is the CEO. Nice to meet you. Then I ask if they could show me the financial department. All right. This always means we go to, the, go to the top floor of the headquarters, and then we meet, here's the CFO, nice to meet you, here's the controller, nice to meet you. Then I ask that I'd like to meet the people who pay the bills. The people who pay the bills for this company. All right, let's go and meet the people. And so far, every single time, the people who pay the bills are middle-aged women. Very nice people, but every time it's been middle-aged women, it could be just one person. If it's a smaller company, if it's an enterprise, it could be five or six or seven people. All right, so what do you do? Well, I pay the bills. All right, great. Um, how do you pay the bills? Well, I use this computer, and she shows me a desktop running Windows 7 or something like that. And then I use this smart card to authenticate the bank access, and then I go through today's bills, and I type them in, and I pay them. All right, great. How much money would you move through this computer every month? And then, of course, the answer depends, but it could be, 2 million euros, 4 million euros, 8 million euros. Depends on the company. In any case, a lot of money. And then I ask my last question, the killer question, which is, could you now show me the computer that you use to go to Facebook? 
and YouTube and for Googling stuff. Where's that? And now she's confused. Like, what do you mean? I use the same computer. And you can sort of see a light bulb go on top of her head. Because she just told me that she moves six million euros through this computer every month. Now she's wondering, like, why do I go to Facebook with the same computer that I'm using to move six million euros every month? And that's a very good question. Because computers are cheap. You could easily buy her a second computer for a couple hundred euros. Like one computer for doing her work, putting in the bills, moving six million euros a month, and then another computer for everything else. This is what you use for all the other work. Don't use this computer for anything else than paying the bills. Use this for everything else. It's not rocket science. It's about thinking the threat model. Because the computer she uses to move six million euros a month, that's the computer the attacks want to get their hands on. That's the one. That's the one they want to target with banking trojans. That's the one they want to gain access to. That's the one you want to protect. And I'm not saying that we should completely seal that computer off the network. You can't do that. She has to be able to access bills and online payment systems and receive email. I'm just saying, don't use it for anything else than what you have to. We have to think about our threat model. We have to think about what the attackers are after. We have to think about what do we do? Who would like to attack us? Who would like to hurt us? And then we start building our defenses. This enables us to put our limited resources and limited budgets in the right place. Not every company is being targeted by foreign intelligence agencies. We, we all like to think about that our companies are really important and, and we make really important stuff. Most of you don't. Most of your companies are not interesting enough for foreign intelligence agencies. If you are running a pizza retail chain, you will never be hit by Russian spies. Because they are not interested in your pizza recipes. No matter how good your pizzas are, they're not going to steal those. However, if you work for a defense contractor, that's a different story. So we first have to think about our threat model. And for many companies, the threat models include things like ventilation systems today. Because we keep finding more and more botnets which are not infecting computers at all. Over the last five years, the rate of new botnets that only infect connected devices is growing faster and faster. These are all botnets which do not infect computers. They only infect security cameras and smart doorbells and appliances or printers. We found the Mirai uh, uh, IoT botnet in 2016. Since then, we found over 40 different versions of Mirai. And Mirai was a big case, not only because it was infecting IoT devices, but also because it created this massively large botnet, which was then used to attack the root DNS servers of the internet. And when Mirai started late in 2016, we were analyzing the attack and fingerprinting the devices which were part of this botnet, and we saw all kinds of IoT gear but especially security cameras were problematic. Why? Because security cameras, all of them today are Linux servers, and they're pretty powerful because a security camera has to be able to encode HD video in real time, and it has to have enough bandwidth to stream HD video in real time. So if you infect a security camera, that's pretty great for a denial of service attack. It has the power, it has the bandwidth to launch very effective denial of security attacks. So as we fingerprinted devices which were part of the Mirai botnet, we could actually see that some of them were in specific companies. So I actually called up some of these companies to speak with their people, to, to ask them like, about the problem themselves. So the call would go like, hello, hello. This is Mikko from F-Secure. Nice to meet you. 
Um, do you have a Hitachi heat pump in your office? Yes, we do. It's right there on the wall. We believe your heat pump is right now part of a global botnet, which is at this very moment taking down the root DNS servers of the internet. You know what he says? He says, oh yeah? Cool. <laughs> and that's not really the answer you're looking for, is it? He thinks it's cool that their heat pump is part of a global botnet. But it's a great example on how Mirai was not the wake-up call for IoT security that we thought it would be. Like, this is the big case. Now people will wake up and pay attention. No, they didn't. As long as the heat pump worked, as long as he could like, click on it and get heat or cooling, he doesn't care if it's infected. He doesn't care if it's part of a botnet. He doesn't care if it's causing problems for someone else, as long as it works. Mirai was not the wake-up call we needed. Victims thought it was cool to be infected. And today, all companies are software companies. It doesn't matter what you do. Your company is a software company, because today the difference between successful companies and unsuccessful companies is how good your company is in digitalization. And this makes computer security a board level topic for every company. Whether you are a factory or a food processing plant or, I don't know, a car maker. What are car makers today? What are cars today? Cars are data centers on four wheels. That's what they are. So we no longer will tell companies to secure their networks like they would be building safes. Yes, you still do need the thick walls and the thick door and the good lock. But you will have to assume that you will get bridged anyway. This just makes it a little bit harder. Instead of trying to keep everybody out, we should focus on being able to detect a breach and being able to respond to a breach. Because the bigger your network, the more likely it is that you have a breach right now. How many of the Fortune 500 companies are hacked right now? Answer, 500. Every single one of them. Why? Because every single one of the Fortune 500 companies has a global network of more than 100,000 workstations. If you have 100,000 workstations, you have a breach right now. It might be a small breach, like an infected laptop at an airport lounge in Tokyo, but it's a breach. You have to assume breach. You have to work on detecting them. You have to work on responding to them faster than in 200 days. And for that, we need new kinds of solutions. We need the motion detectors inside of our networks. And we can take every single attack we've ever seen every single breach we've ever seen. And we can divide all of them into two different groups. Either it's technical problems or people problems. Now, technical problems are things like unpatched servers or vulnerabilities. And they might be hard problems, but at least we know how to fix them. In the end, vulnerabilities are bugs in the code. And the way we fix Bugs in the code is by fixing the bug and updating all of our systems. That can be hard, that can be slow, that can be expensive, but at least we know how to do it. But with people, we have a much bigger problem because we can't patch people. There is no patch for human brain. The only patch we have is education, and education almost always fails. People never learn. No matter how many times you tell them, they will always double click on every attachment. They will always open every link. They will always give all of their passwords to any form which asks for them. And yes, they will always be going on Twitter and then posting public tweets in which they order a pizza.
I quit. <laughs> and then when somebody tells him that that's a bad idea, he asks, why? So we have clearly job security, insecurity. Thank you very much. <laughs>